Okay, hi everyone. I hope this video finds you well. So today we are going to talk about the build process and the loader. We are going to experiment in C++. So we have to ask ourselves a question. What language does the computer speak? So is it a natural language like English, French, Chinese, or high-level programming language like C++, Java, Python? Now, the answer to that is none of these. It's binary, zeros and ones. So we want to explore how we communicate with such a foreign thing. When we say zeros and ones, basically I'm not going to code or program in having a bunch of zeros and ones. I write the zeros and ones. So basically what I want is a source code which is going to be um, in plain English that I can understand and I need some tools to convert that eventually to zeros and ones to a binary file. What we call this process is the build process. This is the build process. That starts with a source code. So basically this is a text file you create. It's um, something in plain English, something that has um, words that you can understand like using, um, namespace, include, print, and so on. So this is referred to as code. And it's no different than when you create a Word document. As you can see, this is in English and you can understand it. So we have something called syntax. Syntax in English means the arrangement of words and phrases to create a well-formed sentences in a language. So our code needs the correct form or syntax. In other words, you must follow the spelling and the grammar rules of the programming language. So the syntax is how you form your sentences in a programming language and what rules you have to follow. Examples of syntax. Having a semicolon at the end of each statement in C++. Or when you print, when you print something, you must have it in double quotes to appear as it is. So in high level language, in computer science, the high level language is a programming language with a strong abstraction from the details of the computer. So it's basically closer to humans, right? Because we write in plain English, and there is some tools which is referred to as the build process going to convert that to machine language that the hardware eventually will understand. So this is the high level language, something closer to us humans. So in comparison to a lot of language, a high level language is using natural language elements like the word answer. You can use answer. You can use X. And it's also easier to use. You may automate or hide significant areas of computer systems like memory management. In C++, we do not do memory management a lot like we do minimal amount of memory management in java for example mostly you won't do memory management except for maybe a little also in high level languages that makes the process of, de of developing a program simpler and more understandable because you do not have to worry about things in low level languages for example like what like providing um, the little or no abstraction from the computer instruction set architecture. 
So the ISA or instruction set architecture of the machine is not directly related to what I write in high level languages. In low level languages, you have to deal with it directly. So commands in the language, in low level language, map closer to the processor instructions. And we are going to see some examples. So currently, programmers almost never write a programs in a uh, machine language because they have higher level languages. So what does that mean to us, to you as a student who is learning programming? So this allows you to spend more time focusing on the problem that you're trying to solve rather than focusing on how to do things together in terms of what the machine understands. For example, you do not, you do not need to manually manipulate the hardware to do things. For example, if you're adding two numbers, you don't have to worry about how they are added internally in the machine. You are just following instructions of how to do that in high level language. It's like doing answer equal A plus B. And A is having, for example, 5 and B is having 7. And answer is going to eventually, you know for sure right now that answer is going to have 12. So this is what you have to focus on. How to be able to do answer equal A plus B. And to have the semicolon that ends the statement. This is part of the syntax. So, for example, here is something in high level language. When you add two numbers, you create a variable. This is the variable and this is the type of the variable. And this is the variable name. And you're storing 125 plus 215. So as you can see, this is so simple. Just following what you should do. The rules of these uh, programming languages. So defining what type your variable. The one um, that stores the result. So it's integer. It's a whole number. The variable name. Because you need to use that um, variable later to retrieve the data. And here is the result you would have. 215 plus 125. If you do that in a lower level language like assembly language, you need to do a lot of steps. Moving data into AX. Or um, setting the address of data. Then moving what you have in AX into DS. Then um, storing 215 to AX. Then saying add 125 to AX and so on. So this is a lot of stuff. Then interrupt. So what um, that means in the uh, application. So that's a lot of stuff. Instead, you can replace it with just something like that, a higher level language that makes your life easier, focusing on how to um, do the coding rather than just um, keep moving things together and moving um, from one place to another. Okay, the second thing after the source file and after uh, we now know you're going to use higher level language we have a compiler. The compiler acts as a translator. It checks for syntax error in your code and usually your source code is stored in a file with the .cpp extension. The compiler takes that file and checks the error, checks for syntax error. Remember, syntax is like grammar and spelling, so that is checking the grammar and spelling errors of the higher level language. It converts your text-based code into a machine code. And this is what we say for simplicity. We say machine code. It's actually object code. 
but for simplicity in this class we are going to call it machine code then machine the machine the computer is going to understand the numbers zeros and ones and this is what a machine code is look uh, is looking like zeros and ones here is a bonus opportunity answer who created the first compiler and this is five points so you must briefly explain who the person was and um, you can write this um, your answer in the assignment page in canvas you can find it under modules um, the module name is understanding the build process and the program loader so if I go to module on your canvas this is where you should write your answer so you click on this one then um, a text entry box is going to show up for you when you hit submit assignment okay so the machine code or machine language is a set of instructions executed directly by a computer central processing unit cpu each instruction performs a very specific task such as like load jump or alu operations arithmetic logical unit operations like math um, on a unit of data in a cpu register or memory so each instruction is designated by a unique set of bits a binary number and actually we are going to see how exactly that is going to be performed in this course not in this lecture but in this course so a high level language is going to use a compiler to convert that to assembly language for example a low level language then to machine language this is intermediary language or intermediary file then a low level language or um, a very low level language like a machine language that the computer understands okay syntax is very important because for example in this picture do we say is this a squirrel eating pumpkin or a squirrel eating pumpkin having the hyphen change the whole meaning okay so we have something called self-repair or self-correction usually speakers monitor the what they are saying and how they are saying it exactly like what i'm doing right now i'm explaining the lecture for you and i'm actually monitoring all the time what i'm saying and if i said something correctly or incorrectly um how to um, avoid making mistakes and if i made a mistake what should i do in this how do i um self-repair or self-correct myself so listeners monitor their level of understanding and can ask for clarification and this is what you do as a student so it's exactly like if um you create some kind of confusion scenario like when Alice says I have a cousin who teaches there but basically what is there where so Bob says where Alice says oh uh, Columbia still you don't know whether it's Columbia University or Columbia the country so Bob says Columbia Alice says oh Columbia University then you understand that um, she talks about the Columbia University in Manhattan. So the object code is created by the compiler. It's stored in a file with the extension .obj. So basically, this scenario is about how the compiler is going to get you to fix the errors, the syntax errors, spelling and grammars, right? Until it has a clear idea what to put in the object code. So object code is going to have a sequence of statements or instructions in a computer language, usually machine language. And as I said, we are going to talk about this more and more during the quarter 
So the linker. The linker basically combines our object code with existing code. Existing code, it could be a code you created previously, or it can be a part of a standard library. We are going to know what are those standard libraries. Actually, those are libraries where we use tools from or other code from. Someone did them. Basically, those are the standard libraries set by the C++ community. Or maybe, or maybe it could be another library that is created by another developer. It doesn't have to be from C++ community or the creators of C++. It could be another developer. So the linker creates an executable file which is saved on the hard drive, on the disk. And this is the most important um, statement in this slide. The linker creates an executable file. So the compilation and the building um, of your program is going to be your source code, and this is a file. This is a tool, a compiler that converts your source code to object code after checking the syntax errors. Then we uh, created an object code file. This is an object file. Then the linker takes your object file with the existing libraries you have used in your source code and link them together, combine them together to create an executable program that your computer can run. Now, now we have a file that could be run. It's stored on the hard disk and we can run it as many times as we like. Now, do we need to rebuild this executable file whenever we run this executable file, this program? No, we do not need to rebuild it unless we have some changes inside. We made some changes. So there is another program that sets it up to run as a process, and it's called the loader. So the loader is a program that is part of the operating system, like Windows, Mac OS, or Linux, that is responsible for loading programs and libraries. Loading program involves reading the executable file into memory. When I say memory, I mean RAM. And carrying out other tasks to prepare for running. So once the loading is complete, the operating system starts the program by passing control to the loaded program code. So what you have to take from this slide is that the loading program processing um, or the loading process is just reading the executable file into the RAM and carrying out other tasks to prepare for running. And the loader is a program that is part of the operating system. Okay, having this chart is gonna make it easier for you. So here's an executable file. You have it loaded. That enters the loader. The loader adjusts the memory addresses if needed and make it as a running process in RAM where the, for example, the um, window of that application pops up and you can see um, or you can deal with that window. So here's some key points. The executable file is the file on a disk. The loader takes the executable file and set it up to run as a process. The process is what runs in memory. When I say memory, I mean, again, RAM. Okay, final point. When you have to deal with the Visual Studio, you will see a green button like this one. So basically, this is not a magic button. This is a button that does both processes, the building process and the loading process. So in the near future, you will be dealing with this program, the Visual Studio, you're going to be creating and testing programs, and you will often create uh, click on green arrow 
to run the program. This one. Whenever you are doing that, just remember that you're doing three steps. Saving your changes, what you have changed on the .cpp file. Doing the whole build process. And then following that by loading the program. This is what you are doing. Okay, here is a homework for you. Explain the build process to two different people. So be sure to discuss source code, um, syntax, text files, binary, um, machine language, executable, and all these things you have learned today to two different people. Ask them what parts of your explanation that uh, weren't clear enough for them and ask them to write you. So when you do that, do that in Canvas, go to modules and in modules you are going to see um, this assignment page. Explain the build process to two people. So in here you also are going to find a text entry box where you can submit your um, summary of the feedback from this, these two people and their ratings. So here is the steps. Here is the steps. And why we are doing these explanation um, homework? Because this prepares you for your exam. Um, prepares you also to explain technical things to both non-technical and technical people because you may have uh, a parent or a brother who is working in uh, business um, or working in um, the iron industry. They are non-technical people, right? They don't know much about computers. So how they are going to receive information from you are they going to understand everything or they are going to have some feedback to you that you have to um, adjust something, you have to make um, some kind of uh, modification to your explanation to be better at it? So basically the ability to explain things is a skill just like hitting a baseball. The more you practice, the better you will get. And the ability will be important both for getting a job and being successful in a job. The process used um, reinforces good study habits. So here's the steps um, in assignments to explain. I'm going to say it only once. Um, so review the topic before you explain it. Try to explain it to someone. Get their feedback and ask them what parts were not clear enough. Um, ask them to rate your explanation 1 to 10, like 10 being high. Um, do a self-assessment of your explanation. Determine what areas you felt you um, were um, weak on or not clear enough. Um, what approaches could you use to better understand and better explain the topic? Um, consider ways to improve your explanation. Allow time to pass, at least like an hour or so, um, to between the first explanation and the um, other. Um, interleave these uh, other studying um, other topics or activities between the explanations and repeat this process with a different person. So why the spacing between the explanations? Because decades of research have demonstrated that spacing out study sessions over a longer period of time improves long-term memory. So if you have 12, hour, 12 hours to spend on a subject, it's better to study it um, that subject for three hours each week for four weeks than just um, doing all the 12 hours of the subject in one week. And for the most part, the more time you take um, between study sessions, the better off you are at it. Um, at some point, waiting too long between sessions could not could have negative effects. So be wise when you have the spacing. Like an hour or so would be okay between the two explanations. Uh, most of us pace far too little. Um, too much spacing um, is not really um, a danger to anyone um, should worry about. 
Um, why does mixing up subjects matter help the learning process? Try to study different things between practice and study sessions. Um, learning, forgetting, then relearning helps the brain cement the new information for long term. And interleaving forces students to notice and process the similarities and the differences among the things they're trying to learn, giving them better, deeper understanding of the material. And um, the importance of self-assessment, it can provide insight um, into your true comprehension of um, and um, can help to identify gaps in your knowledge. You can define um, their own goals and steps required to meet them. Um, to assess your work, you must develop their judgment skills so they can find what is good or bad about your work. Um, this ability is to judge the quality of a piece of work can then be more widely applied to work of others. Okay, that's it for today. See you in the next video. Stay safe.